Hello and welcome to Midweek Matters. Classrooms are seldom in the news. When they are, it is more often than not for the wrong reasons. The recent happenings in Karnataka brought us face to face with the ugly truth that classrooms can become political battlegrounds. They can foster and celebrate and be the spaces that reflect our country's diversity. Or they can be turned into arenas for assertion of dominance and attempts at resistance. This is the new reality that is taking shape in our new India. Ever since the disturbing happenings from Udupi were reported, I couldn't take my mind off the classroom. A space that is more important to me than the sanctum sanctorum of the most sacred place of worship. Today, I want to share with you some of my thoughts about classroom and the experience of my journey through that sacred space. I lived a lot of my life in classrooms, really a lot of it. I have been in the classrooms of every stage, from the lowest class to the highest one that our institutionalized learning offers. 10 plus 2 plus 3 plus 2 plus 2 plus 4. 10 years of school, 2 years of pre-university, 3 years of bachelor's course. Two years of master's, two years of research degree, and about four years of doctoral degree. Almost a quarter of a century if you add it up all. I sat in the most primitive classrooms of a municipal school in a small town. I also sat in the classrooms in some of the globally renowned institutions in the world's bustling metropolises. Sometimes, I also lectured in them. I am a creature of classroom, like many of you. Classrooms shaped me in more ways than I can ever know. All that is good and bad in me is given to me in the classroom, like it did to many of you. I went to a municipal school. It was an old house, not a structure built for a school. In the front room, on the left sat the headmaster and other teachers. The tiny room on the right was some sort of a space for store. The veranda that connected these two rooms had classes running. When you step over the threshold and enter the central room, you are in another classroom. There were two rooms to the left and to the right of the central room. They too were classrooms. If you proceeded further inside from the central room, you had what probably was the kitchen. That again was a classroom. There was some space in the backyard. A large thatched shed was put up there. It housed three classrooms with no partitions. During the school hours, the whole place was noisy. Teachers raised their voices so that their students could hear them. Everyone could hear everything that every teacher in the school had said. We sat on benches that were only a couple of inches above from the floor. We walked to the school. As soon as we reached the class, our teacher sent some of us to the houses of students who did not yet come to the school to fetch them. For the first half an hour or so, we did these errands. We were students as well as attendance mobilizers. Teachers also went to homes of students who did not turn up continuously for a few days, spoke to their parents and brought the children back to school, into the classroom. Everyone was welcome in the classroom. Our small town had sizable number of Christians and Muslim populations. In the classroom, we were all together maybe faintly aware of our religions, but never conscious of them. We never thought we were different. We were never the other for each other. My high school was a proper school building, had a large playground. 
It has spacious, airy classrooms with proper two-seater, solid wooden benches and desks with inkwells on them. We never used inkwells, but they were there. It was run by the Godavari Delta Mission. In the morning, from the classrooms, we marched to the assembly to the Sare Jahasya Chakyo. The assembly ended after a brief reading from the Bible, a short prayer and a few words from the headmaster. It concluded with the singing of the national anthem and we marched back into our classrooms to the tune of Sare Jahasya Acha, the public address system played. We had strict, old-fashioned teachers. They were our idols, our gods. We feared them, respected them, and were in awe of them. My intermediate was in the college in our small town. The main building of the college was originally the residence of the Dutch factor. Some sheds with asbestos roofs and some proper RCC rooms were built around that structure. Medium of instruction was Telugu, with English as one of the taught subjects. It was taught well. So much so, when I went from my degree in English medium, I did not find the transition difficult at all. A small challenge was oral expression, but that was overcome with ease in a few months. This degree college is run by Jesuit priests, large campus, Spartan class and hostel rooms, pleasant surroundings and simple food. Strict discipline. Teaching imparted clarity on every concept and every subject. There were no prayers, no preaching, no mention of religion. Our lecturers were Hindus, Muslims and Christians. So were the students. No one ever made us conscious of our religious identities. Of course, elective subjects or the hostels we belonged to defined our identities. Nothing else. When I came to the university, it was a culture shock to me. We carried cups of tea into the classroom. Girls and boys sat together next to each other. Nothing was imposed on us. The campus buzzed with activity into the wee hours. Nobody told us to get back to the rooms, switch off the lights and go to bed. Classroom, child hava, hostel dining hall and students union election campaign meetings echoed each other. One spilled into the other. We devoured books, debated endlessly, hanged around the library. Campus life was unregulated, but not directionless or purposeless. Self-discipline was the norm. We never had a dull moment. There was no violence, no ragging, no eve teasing on the campus. It was a safe place for all of us. Our identities were predominantly the schools or centers we belonged to. They were academic and political. Sometimes faintly regional, yet not parochial. But never ever religious. Our campus has produced a Nobel laureate, scores of top bureaucrats, chief secretaries, director general of police, ambassadors, professors, vice chancellors, members of parliament, and leaders of political parties. Two most important portfolios in the present union cabinet are held by its alumni. All of them are serving the country, society, and humanity with distinction. While my university JNU was India in microcosm, classrooms at the LSE were the world in microcosm. Students from every continent, every racial group on the planet thronged the campus and the seminar halls. Our old theatre hosted lectures by leaders of every conceivable persuasion, from far right to far left. They spoke with dignity. We heard them with respect. Every speaker was challenged, their ideas and practices interrogated. 
but there was no heckler's veto, no cancel culture. Our classroom was a safe space for ideas, for debates, for reflection, for questioning and disagreement. No one was othered or barred from it for their attire, attitude, beliefs, gender, orientation, culture, religion, language, accent and background. What I told you so far is not my story. It is the story of the classroom, mainly the story of the Indian classroom. The most distinguishing feature of it was its universal accessibility, its celebration of the country's diversity and pluralism, its creed of tolerance. A family's poverty and social status did not bar its children from entering it and from learning. From primary level to doctoral level, a student's belief, religion, attire, culture and food habits were not contested, not questioned. Nor are they asserted as a mark of identity. The classroom did not demand homogenization. It was not seen as an arena of assertion of identity by insisting on the wearing or removal of attire. The economic status of children's parents has not determined the kind of classroom they went to. The story has changed. Today, there are high-end private schools that have air-conditioned classrooms, air-conditioned transport and five-star facilities. Their excursions are to exotic places, even to overseas destinations. Their classrooms are equipped with state-of-the-art physical infrastructure. They have audiovisual aids, internet facility, latest teaching learning materials. New breed of private universities too flaunt such expensive facilities. But in stark contrast, the classrooms in our government schools and public universities are in a pathetic condition. Even the low-end private institutions have better classrooms. Thus, today we have a classroom for the rich and a classroom for the poor. This change has been in the making for quite some time now, perhaps since the late 1990s. There is another way the story of the classroom is beginning to change. Its social inclusiveness is now under threat. What is presently being played out in Karnataka has the potential to become a template. Let us not brush it aside as a passing phenomenon or something that will be limited only to Karnataka. Governments now feel that they can assume the right to deny serving egg to the students, to decide whether they can wear a particular clothing in the classroom. A pushback from the students and their parents is turning classroom into a battleground, into an ugly arena for sharpening of religious polarization and deepening of social cleavages. There is one more serious dimension. The classroom is under physical attack too by ideologues who deploy masked and rod-wielding mobs to make their ideas persuasive and to dominate campuses and classrooms. The government and a compliant police force aid them. And these two threats are new India's gifts to our classroom. That's all for now. I have some writing commitments to fulfill and some travel to do. I'll be back again towards the end of April. Stay safe and do take good care of yourselves and all your loved ones. Until then, bye.